My name is Rick and I'm with CodeWithIntent.com and in this video I want to show you how you can set up MongoDB with a local client in order for you to be able to modify your database. We'll be covering RebelMongo, hum Humongous.io, security, and a little bit about Jace Academy. So let's go ahead and get into it. Alright, alright. Rick, why in the world do we need to do this? Well, there's actually a couple of reasons why I needed to do this. But before I get into any of the reasons and any of the tutorial and any of the different specific configurations and all of this is I want to tell you this so you're actually aware of this. By no means do I declare myself a security professional and I do not pretend to one to be one on the Internet. So please, please, please take this post with a grain of salt because security is a is a big issue and you need to be constantly aware of it and you need to constantly be maintaining it and security is constantly changing again specifically with mongodbs and no sql databases you really have to be careful with security just because a lot of the time these databases out of the box come out with literally no configurations and they be they are very vulnerable if you don't know how to secure them properly now back to the reason why i actually even need to do this in the first place the main reason why I needed to do this was because I'm getting to I'm getting myself ready to prepare to launch jaceacademy.com. And if you guys are not familiar with jaceacademy.com, it is a web application that I've been working on that shows you different types of screencasts that you can actually uh, learn from to be able to program in JavaScript. Now, the application itself is using Mongo to store the documents for the application itself. So there's a couple of different decisions on why I decided to go with Mongo, specifically because this application is not gonna grow to this huge, large data sets and my joins are not that complex. So I decided to go with MongoDB. There's a lot of decisions to go when you decide on a database, but MongoDB seemed like the right choice for me. Again, the reason why I'm doing this is not for my convenience, I'm doing this for my customers. And the reason for this is because my paying customers deserve, hear that? They deserve the utmost best customer service experience that I can deliver. And I love each, each and every one of my paying customers. So in order for me to be able to provide that, I need to be able to go onto the database and be able to make changes to the database, whether that be giving them a promo code, uh, adjusting a setting, whatever it might be, the, this will allow me to do that. But you must be saying, Rick, 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 why in the world did you just program into the app? You can just program into the app and have all these functionalities pre-built into the application itself. Well, that's kind of wrong. You do not want to build uh, a huge application that does everything your customers want it to do. And the reason for this is because software revolves around them and, and the software ultimately comes down to helping them. So it's not about you, it's about them and, and ultimately what they get out of the application. So in simple terms, I just wanted to create the simplest thing that I can create and get feedback back from each, each and every one of my customers in order for me to be able to create the right tool for them to learn. So that's all it comes down to. So again, that's the main reason why we're doing this tutorial here. So there's there's different kinds of options that you can have. There's there's wide variety of options that you have when it comes down to picking a client for MongoDB. And the most common MongoDB clients you'll find out there is RoboMongo. So if you guys are watching the video for this, RoboMongo, it can be found at robomongo.org. And here you can go ahead and download the client and they support three operating systems, which is Windows, um, OS X, and Linux, I believe. So they support pretty much all cross cross platform support for different operating systems, and they offer pretty good um, documentation. The application is nice to use. I mean, it has the right functionality. It, I mean, the application is pretty solid. So if you ever done any MongoDB development before, you probably use Robo Mongo because it's the most common application that you'll typically find out there, and. Ultimately, I wanted to use RoboMongo, but the thing is, is sometimes um, I don't have my machine to be able to access this. And if I have a customer that has to, to, you know, I need to do some specific change in the database, then I really need to be able to quickly log in and make that change. 
And the only tool that I have found that comes even close to that is these different admin UIs that the MongoDB team provides for you. And this can be found at docs.mongodb.org. And here you'll find all the different admin UIs that are available for you, depending on what you're trying to do. Some of these might be a little bit more uh, towards what you're going for, or they might be an overkill. For me, the simplest term that I needed is because I need to be able to access this administrator panel in order for me to make changes to the database. I found that humongous.io did about everything I needed to do. And let me go to this link here. And this is humongous.io. And they pretty much provide you a user interface that you can go on and you can actually view your database, view the collections, view uh, different values, change those values, do stats on the database. It's pretty nifty. And I mean, look at this, you can even access it from your phone, which is ultimately what I want, just in case if I'm on the road, I need to be able to change the database value. I can just go over to uh, humongous.io and, and set that up. And again, the pricing for them is really cheap. I mean, this is like literally a drop in the bucket. $19 per month if you have three projects and a team of 10 widgets, three projects that you can actually set up for 20 bucks a month, or you can do the free plan, or you can do the professional for $50 a month. So, I mean, this is nothing, guys. This $20 a month is literally nothing for your business. So I decided to go with them. I set up the account. I got it all going. And I, when I was setting this up, I found out that there was lots of issues, especially with security, which is why we're talking about this today. Um, and a lot of these issues came because the... The way Mongo handles securities is very picky. And here's just kind of my guideline that I used. Again, more than likely, you probably want to make something a little bit more complex for your setup, especially if you have a cluster of these uh, MongoDB instances that are talking to each other over either a uh, specific interface or within a specific area of a network, whatever it might be, you might have to take into consideration again and take this with a grain of salt. This is a one be all security for Mongo, but if you just have one MongoDB and you need to be able to access that MongoDB from one machine, this is exactly what you need. Again, the first step is to be able to block all the traffic that is going into that port. And uh, for this example, I use 27017, which is a default port for Mongo. And I would actually encourage you to change that port to 27 or whatever number you want to use there, a port that is free on your computer, because this will allow just a small obfuscation. So if somebody does try to attack your server, they're going to have to scan all the down ports in order for you to, be, to find that open port, which takes a little bit longer instead of having a pre-script program that actually goes in and attacks a specific port. Again, small obfuscation just makes it just a little bit more difficult to attack your server and just a small security there. So typically what you will find is a different port there. I went with 2717 uh, just for this write up so you guys can actually see that based on the documentation that's out there. So the first thing is you wanna be able to block all traffic that goes to that port. And you can do this with the IP tables command. And I provide the IP tables command here and I also provide a link to the man pages where you can actually read up on what all these flags mean. The second thing is to be able to accept connections to that uh, port and which what the ones you want to accept is going to be your local loopback which is 127.0.0.1 and you also want to accept the IP address of the client that's going to be connecting over to that MongoDB instance. Now the client that I'm using is, is the humongous humongous.io I think that's how you say it yeah humongous.io and oh we can actually yeah humongous.io and they actually require you to whitelist their IP address and the way you would whitelist is by using this command again with IP tables and be able to put that out to that port next thing up is to be able to save these IP table changes which you can do with IP table save and this great goes ahead and creates this file here. Then you need to create another file in your uh, up.d directory in order for you to be able to uh, call that file on startup. And you also need to append to that file They you actually wanna go ahead and initiate that com file on startup. So you can do that with that echo command. 
And lastly, it's just to make that uh, script executable. And once you do that, the last thing is to set up the credentials with MongoDB. So it's a pretty good idea that you uh, enable authentication with Mongo and that you disable the HTTP interface and then you create a user with the proper permissions. Again, this can all be found in mongodb.conf or if you installed from a uh, tar file, then wherever you have your conf file. But once you have those set up correctly, then then this is pretty good practice to dis disable the HTTP interface, allow only authentication with credentials, but this does mean you have to change uh, the value once you log into the machine with the proper credentials. And lastly, is be able to connect uh, using, using the credentials. So you can actually test this out if you do Mongo, the IP address of the machine, and the port that you wanna go ahead and test. And last thing is to restart the service. And, and if you wanna just restart the service, you can do this by simply uh, doing service mong mongodb restart, and this will restart the service. But more than likely, you're, if you wanna test out if the IP tables changes are working correctly, you probably have to restart the server. And you can just do that with the control panel for your server, or you can do that with a command. And and the, the main thing that I want you to remember here is if you have all your services set up correctly, if you restart the server, you shouldn't have to do anything. This changes should automatically just take effect. And that's pretty much all there is to this um, tutorial here on how to set up MongoDB in production with local clients. Again, I was, I was planning to create a demo for you guys of connecting all these machines and, and pulling up the terminal and running all these commands and showing you netstat and showing you different ports and verifying that ports are closed and and doing all this fun stuff. But I decided that uh, I, I want to know from you if, if you want to hear more about MongoDB and specifically how to set up MongoDB and maybe maybe some more administration roles with specifically with MongoDB and maybe how you can actually integrate credentials with your um, Node application or Rails application that's using MongoDB as a backend to store the data. Again, if this video was useful, make sure you give it a thumbs up. That'll help out a lot, a lot. And make sure if it was useful and you know somebody that could use some use of it, make sure you tweet this video out and so they can get some value out of it as well. Again, that's all there is for this video. I'll talk to you soon.